Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining me today as we discuss the basics of scleral lenses. My name is Anita Gulmiri, and I'm an assistant professor at the New England College of Optometry, as well as an attending optometrist at one of the college's owned and operated clinics uh, called the New England College of Optometry Center for Eye Care. I work at their contact lens department, and then I also spend some time at Boston Medical Center in the contact lens department as well. So without further ado, let's get started on scleral lens assessment and fitting. So as a general basic intro to scleral lenses, um, as many of you may already know, scleral lenses have made a comeback over the last decade. And before this time, only a handful of practitioners were fitting scleral lenses and not many commercial scleral lenses were being manufactured. Fast forward to today, in the United States, we have countless scleral lenses at our disposal and each with their own unique design and features. So the first scleral lens was discovered in 1988 and it was made out of blown glass. Um, interestingly, it was still at that time being utilized for conditions such as keratoconus and even to correct high refractive errors, even back in 1988. Um, after that period, scleral lenses sort of lost momentum as glass was a poor oxygen permeable material. Um, then they were reintroduced with the introduction of uh, PMMA plastic material. Now, the PMMA plastic material was less fragile than glass, and it, but it was more accurately um, able to allow for a more optimal fit. So that was the advantage of having PMMA on board. Um, but once again, uh, PMMA as well did not provide enough oxygen um, permeability to stick around. And then as um, corneal rigid gas permeable lenses were introduced, um, followed by soft contact lenses made their way into, into the industry, um, scleral lens research and development sort of came to a halt for the time being. However, uh, scleral lenses have made a full comeback, probably stronger more now than ever before. And we as scleral lens fitting practitioners have many different options um, at this time and day um, for even the most challenging fits, um, challenging eyes. And to me, one of the most rewarding aspects of scleral lenses um, is the ability to postpone or even prevent surgery, um, prevent corneal surgery, that is. All right, so just to uh, get an idea of um, who I'm speaking with today, I'd like to know how familiar you are with scleral lenses. So uh, this is our first poll question. Um, so how familiar are you with scleral lenses? Uh, a, I fit scleral lenses in my practice all the time. B, I have fit a scleral lens in my practice before, but do so rarely. C, I have not yet fit a scleral lens in my practice, but have fit them on colleagues or attended uh, scleral lens workshops. Uh, and D, what, what is a scleral lens? I'll give you guys some time to answer that. Okay, great. Um, so I see that we have some participants that um, have fit a scleral lens uh, before, that's great. Uh, and then we have um, some that, you know, kind of know a little bit about it, but maybe not much. And then um, some that, you know, want to know what a scleral lens is. So that brings me right to my next question, uh, next um, slide here. So what exactly is a scleral lens? Um, so just as a review for those of you that do know what a scleral lens is, um, these are rigid gas permeable lens materials of large diameter, and they're designed to vault over the entire cornea and land peacefully on the sclera. And it, in its most true definition, a scleral contact lens contacts the sclera, and there's absolutely no contact with the cornea. Now this allows the lens to vault over or clear over any irregularity or diseased ocular surface. Uh, this lens holds a liquid reservoir of non-preserved saline so that the cornea bathes in this fluid when the lens is worn um, with some but a very limited tear exchange. So um, just to you know, compare scleral lenses to corneal gas permeable lenses, many of you may be more familiar with corneal gas permeable lenses, and I still fit a lot of these in my practice today. Um, without going into too much detail about uh, corneal GPs, um, you know, they have a list of advantages of their own, um, but by definition, corneal GPs rest completely on the cornea. Um, they're typically smaller than 10 millimeters, they're designed to move on the cornea to allow for ample tear exchange. 
Uh, and since the cornea is an extremely sensitive tissue with lots and lots of nerve, nerve plexus, there is more lens awareness with a small diameter um, GP. In contrast, scleral lenses rest on the conjunctiva, which is far less sensitive. Um, there's also limited movement with scleral lenses, so there's less lid interaction and thus less lens awareness. And it may seem counterintuitive um, because of the very large size of the scleral lens, um, but it's surprisingly very comfortable because there is no contact with the cornea. Another point to note, compared to corneal GPs, a scleral lens tends to be a lot more stable on the eye. Um, my patients that have trouble with retaining the lens in their eye, you know, whether it be dislodging the lens or the lens decentering, I typically switch these patients into a scleral lens, and a lot of them report improved success with these types of lenses. Um, so in summary, I would say scleral lenses provide similar, if not improved visual potential, um, but more stability and more patient comfort as well. So the Scleral Lens Society introduced an internationally recognized no nomenclature for describing scleral lenses based on the resting zone of the lens and not lens diameter. So it was previously um, categorized, scleral lenses were previously categorized um, by the lens diameter. Um, the new nomenclature is basically characterized by where the lens lands. So if the, if the lens lands on the cornea, it is, it is deemed a corneal lens. If it lands entirely on the sclera, it's called a scleral lens. And if it lands somewhere in between, it's called a corneal scleral lens. So sounds easy enough. Now the reason behind the change in nomenclature is based on the relationship between different sized corneas and lens diameters. For example, in someone with a microcornea, that relationship with a 10 millimeter lens would be very different than that of a normal cornea that's about 12 millimeter cornea. So when there's full scleral landing, the lens definition can be further broken down into a mini scleral and large scleral design. If less than six millimeters larger than HVID, then it's classified as a mini scleral versus a large scleral if there's more than six millimeters um, of HVID sorry, if the lens is larger than six millimeters of the HVID of the patient. Now, these distinctions serve to emphasize an important point on corneal clearance. So larger lenses have a bigger sagittal depth and therefore more corneal clearance. So greater to your reservoir under the lens compared to a mini scleral lens, which will allow some apical clearance. Now, other factors that may contribute to lens selection are anatomical barriers. <clears throat> a patient with a small palpebral aperture um, may do better with a smaller lens diameter. Um, and if a patient has a pinguecula, um, the, the decision to go smaller to avoid the pinguecula or larger to vault over the pinguecula. Um, and then <clears throat> although scleral lens designs <clears throat> may differ, excuse me, <clears throat> from manufacturer to manufacturer, the basic scleral lens design is the same. And I just want to go over that with you guys real quick here. A basic symmetrical scleral lens can be broken down into three distinct zones. The first is the optic zone, which houses <clears throat> the base curve and power. Excuse me. <clears throat> Sophisticated optical um, designs can allow us to add front uh, toric, front surface toricity to correct for any residual astigmatism, and also to add multifocal uh, optics on the front surface of the uh, lens as well. Now this zone to an extent can also aid in controlling the amount of uh, central corneal clearance and overall sagittal depth. Steepening this zone can serve to increase sagittal depth, while flattening can serve to reduce sagittal depth. The transitional or intermediate zone is the point um, from the lens, and I'm just gonna use my marker here. Um, so this is our optic zone here, and then we have our transitional zone here, uh, demarcated in this little red. So the transitional intermediate zone is a point from the edge of the optical zone to the scleral lens landing zone or the haptic zone. This zone has a lot more impact on the sagittal depth. And what I mean by sagittal depth is this area here. 
Okay, so technically our sagittal depth is all the way from, of the lens is all the way from here to here. Um, but since the lens is landing on the sclera and, um, you know, vaulting over the cornea here, I'm just going to kind of tell you guys that the, the depth, including the corneal depth, um, can extend from here all the way to here. Um, so that transitional zone has a lot more um, control over the sagittal depth. So manipulating that can manipulate the amount of liquid reservoir we have underneath the scleral lens. Um, in most lens designs, uh, these changes can also be performed independently of the optical zone or the haptic zone. So if you really only wanted to change the sagittal depth of the lens, that can be established with just manipulating the transitional zone, but maintaining uh, the same optic zone or in the same haptic zone. Uh, this zone can also be designed in a reverse geometry profile, and this is important for patients that are post-refractive surgery, um, post-LASIK, or post-penetrating uh, keratoplasties. The haptic zone, or the scleral landing zone, is the area where the lens makes contact with the ocular surface, so this zone right here, where it lands right on the sclera. Okay, the goal here is to uh, distribute the weight of the lens evenly over the entire landing zone so as to limit any pressure and to align with underlying conjunctiva as closely as possible without bearing into the conjunctiva. In terms of scleral lenses, um, a, back uh, a back toric lens design, I'm just going to quickly touch on this, uh, refers to the peripheral edges uh, being steeper or flatter as compared to their opposite meridians. Um, and we're beginning to learn a lot more about the shape of the sclera um, just because of the invent and I guess the resurgence of scleral lenses. Um, we're starting to study um, what the scleral topography is like more now than ever before. So, you know, aside corneal topography, now we're delving into what the scleral topo topography is to aid us in fitting scleral lenses a lot more accurately. Um, so more often than not, the anterior ocular surface is actually asymmetrical in shape. Um, and we know that the scleral shape in most eyes is steepest temporally and flattest nasally, and that this is suspected to be related to the ocular, um, extraocular muscle insertion, in that the medial rectus is the most anterior, so it, it uh, contributes to the lens um, sitting a certain way uh, in most um, design cases. So one of the other important discoveries over the last decade has been that the scleral tericity increases the further away we move from the limbus. So beyond 16 millimeters, we're likely to see a lot more um, toric peripheries than when we're closer or smaller, um, closer to the limbus. Okay, now this is, there's also very, um, I also wanna add that there's also very uh, little correlation between the corneal and scleral tericity. So just because a patient has an exorbitant amount of corneal tericity, that doesn't necessarily mean that um, the scleral tericity is also going to be um, high and vice versa. All right, moving on to um, just uh, talking a little bit more about the toric periphery. Um, so a toric peripheral curve landing zone design serves to better match the natural toric nature of the sclera as we were just talking about. Um, this serves to meet our goal of evenly distributing the scleral lens so that there are fewer areas of localized pressure and, that, and uh, lead, less lens edge lift. It also helps us in improving centration uh, and to decrease any air bubbles from getting underneath the lens or any debris from entering uh, under the lens. To assess the need for toric peripheral curves, an easy method is to utilize sodium fluorescein. So applying on the outer surface of the scleral lens and then just watching as the fluorescein enters the lens chamber. If the sodium fluorescein is entering um, in an asymmetric pattern, um, or more in one meridian than another meridian, um, you might want to utilize a toric peripheral landing zone um, to better align the sclera to the lens. 
Um, so upon examination, if the tear reservoir also looks like a snow globe where you see a lot of debris trapped underneath the lens, um, this is another sign that you know you may need to add some toric peripheral curves as one of the meridians um, of the scleral landing zone may be flatter, um, allowing debris to enter the lens, uh, enter the lens chamber, I should say. And then you can also use OCT, and we will talk a little bit more about OCT in, in a little bit here. You can also use an anterior segment OCT to visualize the edge of the scleral lens and identify any areas of asymmetry across the edge profile of a scleral lens. So to review um, and summarize, the benefits of a back surface toric design include providing even distribution along the lens landing zone so that there's a decreased localized pressure in one aspect of the sclera. And we have found that adding a peripheral toric curve also increases patient comfort. It reduces uh, debris buildup like we spoke about. Um, it prevents bubble formation. It reduces flexure on the eye. It's also beneficial in providing rotational stability, which is very important if you're adding front surface toric optics onto the lens, uh, because at that point you really want the lens to be stable and stationary. And so overcoming all of these challenges can ultimately reduce a lot of valuable chair time as well, and you know, increase in patient comfort. All right, scleral lens indications. So there is an increasing number of application in scleral lens indications beyond just keratoconus, which uh, seems to be one of the biggest reasons we're utilizing scleral lenses today. Um, the main <clears throat> three main indications that we'll discuss uh, are improvement in vision, um, protection of the ocular surface, and providing comfort. <clears throat> so these are examples of condition categories related to corneal irregularity in the setting of corneal ectasia or corneal scarring that can be neutralized by the fluid reservoir of the scleral lens. And of course, more and more practitioners are beginning to fit scleral lenses on normal corneas for just plain refractive errors such as high myopia, you know, regular astigmatism, uh, even irregular astigmatism, and presbyopia, so multifocal um, optics as well. So primary ectasias include conditions such as keratoconus, um, as you can see in this picture up top here, uh, pellucid marginal degeneration, um, keratoglobus, and then post-surgical um, and secondary ectasias from um, status post-corneal transplant, LASIK, radial keratotomy, RK, um, astigmatic keratotomy, and penetrating keratoplasties, like in this picture uh, here. Uh, and then other corneal irregularities uh, include um, primary corneal scarring, scarring from, um, from post-infection, uh, herpes simplex, scarring from trauma, um, and then of course refractive error as well. Scleral lenses can also act as a shield to protect the eye from chronic desiccation as seen in cases of surface exposure, um, neurotrophic disease, and mechanical insults such as trichiasis. Now, there have been benefits described for patients with persistent epithelial defects. So in this top left picture here, um, we see this patient with uh, lag ophthalmos from uh, a blepharoplasty. Um, that results in exposure care keratitis and keratopathy, um, as well as a lot of neo-inferiorly. Top right here um, also has um, lag ophthalmos from an acoustic uh, neuroma that is more severe, resulting in corneal haze and neo in this exposed area. Um, bottom left here, um, seeing a patient with a persistent um, epithelial defect on a grafted cornea. And then bottom right is a patient with neurotrophic cornea from herpes zoster with a persistent epithelial uh, defect and subsequent thinning. So the use of uh, scleral lenses as a therapeutic management of ocular surface disease um, was previously covered in one of the CyberState lectures as well. So I encourage you to listen to that lecture if you want to delve deeper into understanding this aspect of scleral lenses. Um, and um, lastly, providing comfort. So scleral lenses can provide comfort by stabilizing the ocular surface in very extreme ocular surface diseases. Um, they work to allow for epithelial healing and decrease symptoms of burning, stinging, uh, light sensitivity, and foreign body sensation. 
These extreme conditions include uh, surface conditions such as Sjogren's disease, um, graft versus host disease, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, and ocular cicatrice pemphigoid. So in this uh, picture here, uh, we have a patient with a graft versus host disease with a confluent and bilateral corneal staining and filaments, as you guys can see over here. Um, <clears throat> and then after about three hours of wearing the PROS device, um, which um, I can go over in a little bit more detail if, if there's an interest in learning about um, Boston site and the PROS device, um, so after three hours of wearing the pros device, um, we're starting to see a lot less staining and reduced filaments here. And that's only after three hours of wear. All right, now let's um, talk a little bit more about fitting scleral lenses. So we're going to kind of um, backtrack a little bit and, and um, delve down deeper into um, just the basics of um, uh, scleral lens fitting. So some of the challenges that um, practitioners might run into is a determination of the clearance value. So underneath the scleral lens, how much clearance do we really have? Is it adequate? Do we need to um, you know, increase it or do we need to decrease it? Uh, how much should we be expecting? Um, all those kinds of questions. Um, as many of you can understand, fitting can be time consuming as well. Um, there's frequent remakes and uh, that requires frequent visits from the patients uh, to come in and, and try on the lenses. Um, and then there's, you know, complications that can arise with the debris under the, the reservoir, um, surface issues, uh, patient comfort issues, if there's some lead, uh, lens edge awareness. Um, some studies have reported um, on estimate that a new fitting would require about four to six uh, visits and about three and a half uh, lens remakes per patient. Um, another aspect to the challenges is uh, centration. So like I spoke about earlier, um, the tericity of the sclera sometimes can cause the lens to decenter. Uh, typically the lens will decenter down and out. Um, so that's another challenge is, is getting that sclera to scleral lens to fit peacefully and, and gracefully on the sclera so it's aligning well. Um, one of the first issues is knowing where to start. So selecting a good initial lens can save you a lot of time um, from inserting, settling, and removing the lens three, four, or five times per visit. So most manufacturers will include a fitting guide with their diagnostic fitting set and guidelines on which lens to start with, either based on keratometry values or starting with a standard lens vault or even starting with the lens from the middle of the set. And I cannot stress to you enough um, how important this initial step can be. Um, most of these manufacturers have put in countless resources in developing their individual scleral lens design. Um, and so the fitting guide that they've prepared, um, you know, is, is, is a very, very good manual for your success. So I would highly recommend following the fitting guide to get started. Um, and like I said, all fitting guides, I'm sorry, all, um, lenses, lens designs, uh, typically come with a fitting guide. Um, and then most manufacturers also have consultants available at your disposable that you can quickly call or chat online with um, over email um, and get any ideas on where to start if, if that's where you're kind of stuck. All right, so um, preparing the lens. Um, so first and foremost, um, preparing the lens for application is an important step. Um, make sure the lens is uh, cleaned with appropriate uh, gas permeable cleaning solution. Uh, wash your hands and prepare the large plunger for application. So as a reminder, um, we typically use large DMV plungers for insertion and then a small DMV plunger for removal. So in preparing the patient, um, it's always helpful uh, to have paper towels or something covering their lap so that their clothes don't get stained um, because inevitably you will have some fluid leakage as you insert the lens into the eye. So it's helpful to prepare the patient with giving them paper towels ahead of time um, so that they're ready to go to capture any of the uh, fluid loss. On the plunger, you want to center the lens um, onto the plunger. Um, if, if the lens is decentered, um, that's gonna cause some of the fluid to spill out. And also, um, it'll 
you won't be able to insert the lens um, centered on the eye as well. And that'll cause a bubble to form. You'll have to remove the lens and reinsert. So it's always a good idea to get that lens nice and centered on the plunger to begin with. Um, the large DMV plunger has a suction um, on it so that um, when you're putting the lens on, the lens can be nice and centered on the plunger um, and then nice and centered when you're putting the lens in the eye. Now, uh, an important thing to remember is you have to release the suction as you let go of the plunger as well um, when you're inserting the lens. And I'll go over, um, I'll go over that in a little bit more detail. Um, some uh, practitioners and even patients don't like the suctioning aspect as it, it might be too difficult to press the suction to release, um, sorry, press the um, plunger to release the suction. So an option is to cut off the end of the plunger here um, so that there is no suction anymore. Now this also serves to give the patient a little bit of a fixation target as they look into the plunger because um, they can see right through it. So it kind of helps in, in those two regards. Overflowing the lens um, to ensure that no air gets trapped under the lens. Now this will serve to reduce any bubble formation underneath the lens. And then you're, you're filling the lens bowl up with um, non-preserved saline. So these are some of the saline that we use in clinic. Um, just as a side note, um, insurances may cover this for the patient. So I typically send a prescription to the patient's pharmacy, um, and it's written as a single unit dose of 0.9% inhalation saline, um, which is this Addy pack here. Now, um, lacquer pure in the United States has been FDA approved to be used um, in the eye. Um, I'm not too sure about sclerophyll, but I have a feeling it's also been FDA approved. Um, and then pure lens um, is a bottled form of non-preserved saline as opposed to a single um, unit dose. Um, so again, this comes with restrictions on um, you know, when, when you should throw it away within a certain uh, period of time. So inserting the scleral lens, um, so the scleral lens should be placed on a large or medium DMV suction cup to aid stabilization of the lens during handling. Alternatively, uh, the patient can use a tripod method using their thumb, index finger, and middle finger to hold the lens. Uh, the lens should be filled with non-preserved saline solution. And when I say filled, I mean overfilled. So make sure the lens is overfilled with non-preserved saline. The patient is instructed to lower their head so that their face is parallel to the floor. This allows the lens to be inserted from below so that the fluid in the lens doesn't spill out. Now, this is important to avoid bubbles. If a bubble is present, um, you'll need to remove the lens and reapply the lens. Um, otherwise, it can lead to an area of corneal desiccation. It's important to hold the upper and lower lids both lids are wide open and have the patient look downwards toward the floor. Um, I typically have the patient hold their own lid because um, it, it helps me kind of brace uh, the lens a little bit better, um, but you, you have the option of holding both lids yourself as well. Um, another tip is to move quickly and smoothly. Uh, move the lens up onto the eye so that it contacts the sclera. It's important not to push too hard um, as you insert the eye, uh, insert the lens onto the eye. Um, the great pressure can uh, cause uh, you know, uh, a lot of redness around the conjunctiva if it's if squeezed up too hard. Once you come in contact with the eye, you want to squeeze the suction cup so that the lens releases onto the eye have the patient close their eye and make sure the patient has a paper towel or a tissue to, um, to just catch that overflow like we spoke about earlier. Um, you wanna check the fit of the lens and the slit lamp um, and also check to see if there are any bubbles present because remember you'll need to remove the lens and reinsert again. So patient positioning, remember the head needs to be parallel to the floor. What I like to do is actually raise the patient's chair all the way up um, so that they're matching my height. And then I'll have the patient um, lean their head um, all the way down. Um, this helps me so that I'm not, you know, crouched underneath trying to get the lens on. Um, if a patient has a very strong Bell's reflex, you might want to give them a target to fixate on so that they're looking at that as you're trying to um, apply the lens on their eye. 
Now the eye should be centered between the lids um, for proper application. And then of course you can have the patient hold their lower lid in place as well um, so that it's a little bit um, easier for you to just grab the upper lid. So you wanna retract both upper and lower lid um, and move quickly. So with the other hand, you can hold your plunger and you wanna come around, um, around the patient to hold their upper lid, kind of locking their head into place. Uh, you wanna be careful. I mean, you don't wanna to add too much you know, force there, but you still wanna kind of uh, gently hold their head in place so that you're bracing their, um, their head and they're not kind of moving all around. You, you need them to stay stationary as you apply that lens. Um, it also helps to sometimes brace your hand with the plunger against the patient's cheek as you're inserting the lens. Um, this reduces a risk of losing fluid and then once again, it improves some of the, the steadiness and aim as you apply the lens. Move quickly, you wanna squeeze the plunger as, as you apply the lens, um, pull the plunger away and then release the eyelids um, and then let the patient kind of blink a little bit. And then um, you, you want to check for bubbles right away to make sure that you don't have any insertion bubbles. Um, this is an example of a large insertion bubble. So something like this um, requires an action on your part to remove the lens and reapply. Um, this is a great resource um, by Bosch and Loam um, that I give to my patients. Um, typically, I like to recommend the plunger method. If a patient is, um, you know, a little bit fearful of the plunger method, then I'll recommend the three-finger method. Um, but this resource, um, I'll give to them as they leave, um, as they leave after their insertion removal training, uh, because sometimes patients have a tendency to forget what we spoke about, um, so that they can quickly reference this. Um, and I have linked the website uh, below for you guys here if you want to access this um, resource. Um, it also has the three finger method as well for any patients that, um, like I said, might be fearful of the plunger method. Um, there are fixation um, targets and other devices available um, for patients that have issues with mobility or dexterity concerns. Um, so just because a patient you know, has limited movement, um, it doesn't mean that they can't uh, be a good scleral lens candidate and wear scleral lenses. Um, there are other options um, to, imp uh, to help with, uh, with, with this. All right, let's talk about removing the lens. Um, so lens removal, uh, you want to use a small DMV suction device for this um, without a hole. Um, there's, there's two variations of the small suction device. Um, one has a hole and then the other one does not. Um, I prefer the one without the hole in it. Um, have the patient look down with their head um, in upright position. And then, you know, you can also have them lean it against the headrest. Hold the patient's upper lid out of the way. Place the suction cup on the superior portion of the lens, as close to the lens edge as possible, and then gently rock the lens to release the suction between the lens and the eye. Once that suction is released, gently remove the lens, rotating it forward and upward and off the eye. Um, it helps to have the patient look up after suction is released too. Just helps to rotate that lens off the eye for a smoother removal. So here you can see that the patient is sitting upright, um, eyes are lowered, um, and then you're retracting the upper. Um, I, I typically only retract the upper lid, but um, you can retract the lower lid too if, if you feel that's necessary. Um, apply the top edge of the plunger with the top edge of the lens. Um, tap the plunger onto the lens and then gently break suction um, and then arc downwards like your, if, if this is you know the cornea and this is the lens, you wanna kind of Move the, lens, uh, move the plunger in this fashion. And then you can instruct the patient to look up because that'll help to kind of um, take away the suction um, as well. And I have a video here. Making sure to overfill it so that you see a large tear meniscus across the top. Right hand, slowly approaching the eye. Squeezing the plunger and pushing the lens onto the eye, noting some of the extra fluid will drip down. Squeeze and attach the small DMV plunger to the lower edge of the lens, breaking suction and pulling the lens off. The doctor can also brace the upper lid, have the patient pull down the lower lid, and slowly insert the lens, squeezing the plunger as the lens is put onto the eye. 
To remove, the doctor has the patient look down, squeezes the smaller plunger near the upper edge of the lens, breaking suction, removing the lens. Lastly, it's very important to look for bubbles. Bubbles can interfere with vision and also cause decreased comfort. Any large bubbles as seen here, the lens must be removed and reinserted without any bubbles. All right, so we're on to our poll question number two. Which of the following is true regarding applying and removing scleral lenses? Um, a, use a small plunger to apply, large plunger to remove. Um, so this is just to test your knowledge of what we just talked about. Um, B, cutting off the large plunger helps with centration when entering the lens. C, there are no fixation devices available for patients with limited dexterity. Uh, or D, tripod or the three finger method is an alternative uh, for patients fearful of the plunger method. Excellent. So um, most of us got that one correct. So the tripod of the three finger method is an alternative for patients fearful of the plunger method. Um, now remember the large plunger is used to insert the lens <clears throat> and then the small plunger is used to remove the lens. We move on to our poll question number three. Um, I think I made my point with this one fairly clear. So um, let's uh, see if, if, if we got that point across. Um, if you see a bubble underneath uh, the scleral lens, what should you do? Um, a, push up method to dissipate the bubble. B, do nothing as the lens settles. The bubble will dissipate on its own. C, remove the lens, fill the lens with non-preserved saline and reapply the lens. Or D, rotate the lens until the bubble dissipates. Excellent. So yes, most of us got that correct. Um, we should be removing the lens, fill the lens bowl with non-preserved saline and reapply the lens. One quick um, note on there is to um, just know that if it's a very tiny bubble um, and that's kind of moving in its place, not causing any disruption to the vision or comfort, that may be okay. Um, when we refer to um, taking the lens off and reapplying, we're referring to large bubbles that you, that you want to avoid. All right, moving on to assessing a scleral lens. So steps for assessing a scleral lens, um, I typically like to take um, what I call the center out approach, uh, which means I assess the central clearance values first. So I assess the apex of the cornea first, and then I move to the mid peripheral zones. So um, if, if a slit lamp image looks like so, I would look at this area first and then move out outwards um, and then move my um, beam this way and move it that way. Um, it's important to evaluate the limbal zone um, and then evaluating the scleral landing zone or where the, the lens comes into contact with the eye. Um, also important to evaluate the overall centration of the lens um, because if the optic zone is decentered too much then the patient's vision will uh, not be as optimal. Um, and then assessing the movement of the lens is important as well. Um, making sure to document these findings is just as important as evaluating them. Um, there's so many numbers that get thrown around with scleral lenses that it's very important to keep that all clear and um, concise. So documenting, um, you know, the clearance values that you're noting first, um, you know, uh, before the lens has settled. What I like to do is um, when I'm evaluating, I always write down what, um, how long the lens has been on the eye for, because then um, it gives me an idea of um, how much settling the lens has to do, or if it's kind of in its final stages of settling. Determining the um, central corneal values is very important. Sorry, give me one sec here. So determining the um, clearance values uh, using a slit lamp technique, most practitioners use this. And um, this is the technique I would recommend for anyone that doesn't have any um, OCT available. Um, you want to make a very thin optic section, use white light, and uh, make about a 45 degree angle. Um, and you wanna use, uh, so it's similar to the Von Herrick technique you would use to estimate um, the angles. Um, so a thin optic section with white light, approximately 45 degree angle. Most practitioners uh, use a, the lens thickness as a reference. 
um, which is which is what you should do um, if you use a cornea if it's a normal cornea that's absolutely fine um, because we know approximately it's around 530 microns however um, irregular corneas corneas with keratoconus we know that they're unpredictable so sometimes that's not the most accurate way of measuring um, the clearance of the lens uh, clearance uh, underneath the scleral lens. So I would recommend using um, the known thickness of the scleral lens because <clears throat> it's a better reference point for you. Um, it's estimated that the human eye is capable of, of, of observing about 20 microns or more. So less than that to us appears as black. Um, so, but this doesn't necessarily mean that there's frank touch. It just means that it's something that we cannot see. Um, and that's when um, the for, um, OCT becomes more valuable. Um, fluorescein, applying that to the lens bowl, um, you know, where the saline is in, you know, applying a dip of fluorescein is also helpful when the lens goes on. And I'll show you guys this in a, in a second here. And even what was uh, observed here is you can see that the fluorescein makes it a lot easier for us to see um, how much clearance there is underneath the lens. Um, and then one interesting study conducted by the University of Waterloo showed that there is a consistent underestimation of about 50 microns between <clears throat> slit lamp, <clears throat> slit lamp technique and ultrasound technique. Um, and this has, this was re regardless of experience of the practitioner with scleral lens fitting. Um, so that's something important to note as well. Um, lens assessment. I like this schematic <clears throat> to show you guys. <clears throat> This is the lens here, and um, this is the tear film dipped in the uh, fluorescein reservoir, and then your cornea here. So when you're looking at a cross-section of a scleral lens um, and assessing it, this is uh, similar to what you're going to see. Now, th the distance from the posterior lens to the anterior corneal um, surface, this here is what we're measuring when we're talking about the clearance value of a scler scleral lens or vault of a scleral lens. And once again, a good reference point is the lens thickness as opposed to the corneal thickness, which can be very variable. And sometimes we don't always have that information available. Whereas the lens thickness, most of the manufacturers will give us that lens thickness um, uh, when, as we're fitting the lens. And then you want to move on to the mid periphery uh, of the lens and evaluate that from, from the center onwards. Um, and then, of course, we want to make sure we're not resting on the limbal uh, zone there um, because then we're resting on the limbal stem cells and that can cause um, trouble as well. Um, when we're measuring the corneal um, vault, we're measuring it in microns. And as the lens settles, particularly in new wares, the lens will settle more. Um, so as it settles, um, we'll, we're, we're going to see a decrease in the amount of clearance um, that we're seeing. And typically it um, decreases um, about 100 microns or so. Um, and, and most of the settling takes place in the first two hours of wear. Um, but the full amount of settling can take up to eight hours. Um, so I usually have the patient when they're coming back for a reevaluation. I, I make sure that they've at least worn the lens for um, two or three hours so that I can see what the lens looks like post um, settling. Um, uh, alignment of the lens with the scleral shape is important in preventing any air debris from um, getting trapped underneath the lens. Too tight of a scleral landing can lead to complications such as blanching, compression, and impingement, uh, typically assessed by observing the lens bearing with a trial lens. Um, so once you get your trial lens set, you put it on and then you want to take a good look at the periphery and see what changes you want to make. Um, other factors um, that we spoke about already, the toric peripheral zones, um, you know, you want to assess the movement. Um, you can add fluorescein on top of the lens as well to help with um, identifying the um, outer edge of the lens as well if you have trouble seeing that through slit lamp. And this is what they've done here, actually. Um, so this is... Um, Ferris State University um, developed a fit scale based on utilizing fluorescein to estimate the vault values. In this case, the center thickness of the lens is uh, defined as 300 microns. So you can visualize this one-to-one uh, -one relationship here. So 300 microns of the lens thickness and then 300 microns of the tear reservoir underneath the lens. And then here's our cornea here. Um, so 
applying fluorescein to the front surface of the lens can help to identify what the, the top looks like and it kind of gives you a good outline of where the lens is. Um, here you can see 50 microns and how faint that line is there. Um, 500 microns, kind of getting a little bit closer to the cornea here. 150 microns, um, this is kind of what we expect when the lens has um, settled onto the eye. Um, 600 microns, we want to reduce uh, some of the clearance there. And then I'll let you guys look at this on your own here, but it gives you a um, good idea of what the limbal vaulting should be too. Um, you kind of want to have a little bit, so about 50 microns to 100 microns of limbal vault left over um, after the lens has settled. Um, sometimes if there's too much limbal vault, um, then you're, um, you're limiting um, oxygen getting into um, the eye as well. Um, this is a good example of what um, a picture of, of, sorry, good example of what it looks like underneath the slit lamp here. And we can see that the lens here, um, just judging by the way the fluorescein pattern is um, underneath the lens, we can see that the lens is slightly decentered inferiorly because we're seeing a lot more clearance inferiorly compared to superiorly here. And we might even have some touch here. Um, a little bit hard to tell with this little bubble, but um, you can you can tell that the fluorescein actually increases as we go um, as we evaluate inferiorly, so indicating that the lens is is um, is uh, dropping. Uh, these are some pictures of. Um, sorry, the ideal picture here of what the edge alignment should look like. So this is what I would call scleral alignment, where um, the scleral lens is landing evenly onto the sclera. Um, here we're starting to see um, blanching, which can lead to issues with discomfort and redness um, associated with longer wear times. And then in this picture here, we're seeing edge lift, which can result in lens edge awareness upon blink, um, and it indicates a too flat of a, um, of a peripheral edge. And this usually leads to problems with debris getting underneath the lens um, and building underneath the lens and, and getting that snow globe uh, type appearance we talked about earlier. So in this case, look for a um, dark band or shadow to identify any lead lens um, lift. Um, and then insufficient edge lift, um, if it's too tight, it can limit tear exchange and that can pose a problem with the zone as well. So um, coming to our poll question number four, this is a little bit of a challenging question here. Um, which of the following best describes this fit pattern? So is it A, excessive edge lift, B, adequate scleral alignment, C, impingement, or D, blanching? Yeah, <laughs> that's what I expected. I, we're seeing a kind of um, some even answers here. So this was a trick question, and uh, my apologies for making it a little bit tricky here for you guys. Um, so this is what we call elbow compression. Um, so what's happening here is that the lens is actually landing here um, as opposed to landing um, all the way to the far edge of the periphery, okay? Um, so this, there is a little bit of blanching. So those of you that said blanching, um, that's correct. And then there is consequently some edge lift here too, which you guys can see a little bit of that shadow. So this is a scenario where we're kind of getting both aspects. So we're getting um, blanching as well as edge lift. And um, some ways to alleviate this is to uh, pick a lens that's a little bit smaller so that the, the edge actually lands here, um, or you can steepen up the, um, the um, peripheral curves here so that the lens actually lands um, in the far periphery as opposed to the mid-haptic zone here. Um, and then I wanna touch base on um, using anterior segment OCT with scleral lenses. Um, a lot of us now um, do have access to a OCT and this is certainly not necessary to fit a scleral lens, uh, but it is very helpful in um, cases where, you know, you're not 100% positive in um, assessing the, the way the lens appears, whether there's too much corneal vault, um, too much uh, scleral lens vault or too little scleral lens vault where you're not necessarily sure if uh, the lens is touching or not. Um, sometimes I like to take it behind the OCT just to um, confirm my findings as well. 
So it also gives us an exact measurement of the central vault, um, mid peripheral limbal vault, and it can give us an idea of the len uh, lens edge profile as well. Um, so to give you an idea of what some images look like here, so this is the cornea here. Um, our scleral lens is up top here, and then you see the um, fluid layer over here. Now, um, there's, um, this is, these images were taken using a serous anterior static five-line raster. Um, you can use a caliper to measure the amount of corneal clearance underneath the scleral lens, which I like to do a lot to just see exactly how much um, clearance there is underneath that lens. Um, so you can see here 300 microns is preferable as you insert the lens, and then you expect it to kind of settle down to about 160, 100, between 100 and, a, and 200 microns, so 166 is, is excellent. Um, it can also help you identify if there's um, things in underneath the lens, trapped debris underneath the lens. Like you can see these little flecks here that represent some uh, debris trapped underneath the lens. And then it can also help you identify areas of touch. So you can see here the lens itself is um, landing and, and touching the scleral lens here. Um, another, this is a wide angle view. Um, the ability to do that is, is um, with a attachment on our OCT. Uh, but the, the wide angle um, helps us to kind of see the total edge pro, um, sorry, total corneal um, sagittal depth uh, with the lens as well. Um, but again, we can see there's uh, some touch here. And um, I'm going to skip this slide real quick, but there are additional benefits to using an OCT in the interest of time. Um, you guys can read this on your own, but um, a scleral lens OCT can, sorry, an uh, anterior segment OCT can also help with identifying um, not only the lens thickness, but also the corneal thickness if you're worried about um, edema developing. So, you know, taking pre and post scleral lens where um, images on the OCT is helpful. Um, this is a full picture of what um, you end up getting once you take a, an image on the serious um, uh, OCT. So here there's a cross section here and it gives you about five, uh, five line rasters. Um, and then uh, once again, it can help you identify even the most minimal amounts of um, a corneal vault. So this is a patient where I wasn't sure if I had enough corneal thickness over the apex. So I did bring them here um, to to check with the OCT. And uh, in fact, we weren't touching. We were we had about 60 microns clearing. Um, and then in some cases, when there's far too much clearance, um, it helps to um, also get an OCT because at, at some point it just becomes too hard to estimate exactly how many you know, um, lens thicknesses will fit in this range. So sometimes it's just easier to um, put the patient um, behind the OCT to get those numbers, those exact numbers. Um, I really like to also look at the edge of the um, scleral lens and how it lands and comes into contact with the conjunctiva. And the OCT can be helpful in this case as well. This patient here that we're looking at the top two images, um, he kept complaining about lens awareness and every time I would look at the lens, um, I, I thought to myself, you know, it's well aligned. I really don't want to um, tighten it anymore. Um, so I was convinced that, you know, he was imagining this, but when I put him behind the OCT, I was able to appreciate a little bit of um, lift here, as you guys can see. Um, so, you know, it, it does kind of help to confirm your findings um, behind the slit lamp. Um, this is an example of severe impingement where the lens is digging into the conjunctiva. What you want is a, this uh, picture here uh, is an ideal definition. So what you want is about a 50-50, 50% 50, 50, um, 50 of the conjunctiva into, sorry, 50% of the lens into the conjunctiva. So that's kind of what we see here where you're, you're seeing it kind of um, peacefully and gracefully land on that scleral, um, on, onto the sclera. Um, once again, this is good scleral lens alignment here, as you can uh, as you can see. And I do like to play around with the colors as well. Sometimes it helps me, um, you know, uh, see things a little bit better in, in uh, grayscale as opposed to the color. Uh, once again, a severe impingement where the lens really is digging into um, the conjunctiva and causing some conjunctiva to lift up. So this is uh, what we call impingement, where the lens is digging so hard that some of the conjunctiva is lifting up. All right, brings us to our last poll question. 
Um, when estimating the central corneal clearance of this lens based on the slit lamp photo, um, assume central thickness of the lens being 250 microns, what would you estimate to be the clearance? Um, A, 300 microns, B, 500 microns, C, 100 microns, or D, 25 microns. All right, so the 25% that got uh, 300 microns, uh, great job. So I just wanna go over that real quick again, because um, 50% of us thought it was um, 100 microns. So looking at the front surface of the lens, so this um, refractive um, area here is the outer surface of the lens, so the outer edge of the lens. And then the little space here um, is, the um, lens thickness itself, and then where the green area starts, the uh, it looks like it's fluorescein there. So where that green area starts is the back surface of the lens. So from here on to here is what we're measuring. And if we say this area here is 250 microns, um, you know, this area here is very similar in size to that. So maybe slightly larger. So we could say it's about 300 microns. All right. Um, other considerations, um, we did talk about this in, in um, detail, but closely evaluate the need for an asymmetric lens design on the, on the back surface. So if we need toric peripheral curves, a lot of lens designs now offer, um, you know, toric peripheral curves and even quadrant specific designs um, are getting more and more readily available. Um, make sure we have a proper and stable fit before you start to do an over refraction to determine the best corrected vision through the lens. Um, and then evaluate for tear exchange. Um, um, and then at each follow up, make sure you're removing the lens and staining the eye to check for ocular surface um, abnormalities, um, any staining, um, if there's any toxic reaction with um, uh, punctate staining that you can um, pick up. Um, sometimes the patient, you know, won't be exactly sure on, on what to fill their lens bowl up with, and they'll fill it up with um, multi-purpose soft lens solution, and then they end up getting a toxic reaction all over their cornea from the um, preservatives that are in that solution. Um, and then any impingement staining. So a um, you might notice a compression staining once you remove the scleral lens. Um, and if it's you know not too deep into the conjunctiva, sometimes that's okay um, because you know the lens has been resting on the eye for eight plus hours or so. Um, but if it's if it's too deep and causing some staining around that area, then that that fit needs to um, be flattened. The peripheral edge needs to be flattened. Uh, so scleral lens care, we'll quickly go over this. Um, so GP care solutions or peroxide systems um, are useful with scleral lenses as well. Um, care should be taken when cleaning and rinsing the lenses due to the fragile nature. Um, you still want to instruct the patient to rub each side of the lens inside and outside with cleaner for about 15 seconds. There are um, larger cases available um, for uh, patient purchase as well so that their scleral lens can fit um, nicely into the case. Um, if you guys have clear care in, um, in, uh, in, the, in the countries, um, essentially clear care sometimes can be too small for, to fit a scleral lens. So the larger chamber um, case definitely helps. Uh, GP solutions should be rinsed um, from the scleral lens with sterile non-preserved saline prior to insertion. Um, and then if the patient is not planning on wearing the lens for um, a while, then uh, storing it dry is the recommended way to go. Um, and then diagnostic lenses, so any lenses that are in your fitting set that you've used to um, fit the patient should be cleaned and disinfected um, properly with either using a GP disinfectant solution or hydrogen peroxide and then stored dry. Um, plungers, um, you can clean those with uh, soap and water, um, hydrogen peroxide, alcohol wipes, um, and then supplement, supplemental products such as artificial tears um, to lubricate the surface on top, um, and then cleaners um, such as uh, some alcohol-based cleaners. Um, Progent is very helpful too. It's a deep, uh, deep cleaning for the lenses, and then uh, the Boston One Step Enzyme is also a stronger um, cleaner that I would recommend your patients use um, um, either, you know, um, 
every two weeks or every week, depending on how much debris and buildup they um, get on their lens. And at each visit, um, remember to uh, you know, review lens care and insertion removal, um, especially if the patient is new to scleral lenses. Uh, I find this um, by the AOCLE Healthy Habits Sheet very helpful um, when I'm dispensing the lens. It has this little, um, little uh, area here for um, writing down what uh, they should be using to clean the lens, what they should be soaking the lens in, and then what they should be filling in uh, the lens bowl. So um, typically I let the patient leave with a lot of resources after the fitting, um, their initial um, dispense, um, so that if if um, you know they missed anything I said, because I'm giving them a lot of information on that visit, um, if they've missed anything I've said, it's, it's readily available for them to read. Um, and then lastly, I just want to point out to um, use your resources. So there are multiple training videos uh, that the manufacturers um, will put up on their websites for their lens designs, um, their certifications, kind of like quizzes that you guys can take as well. Um, and then consultants are always available for us for troubleshooting, um, ordering lenses, you know, running anything by them. Um, they're available at our disposal. I use them all the time to help me with my fits. Um, so yes, and that's it. I just want to thank um, Dr. Andrew McLeod and our contact lens department at NECO um, for some of the support. And I'm happy to answer any questions we have at this point. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kukumiri. So we have, I think, seven questions. If you want to just stop your screen share and open up. Oh, sure. All right. So. Um, the first question I have is, what is the technique of the scleral lens? Um, all right, so I'm not exactly sure what uh, you mean by that. Um, if you want to elaborate on that question, I'd be happy to answer it um, some more. Um, okay, is it possible to eliminate myopic of that patient using this? Um, so I think um, this question, uh, if you're asking about refractive correction and whether or not you can use uh, scleral lenses for refractive errors, absolutely. Um, if you have a patient with high myopia and you want to um, put that prescription into the scleral lens, you can absolutely do that. And, and um, they, they will get far superior vision compared to a soft lens. Um, now, if you're asking about orthokeratology, which is a little bit different where it's a small diameter reverse geometry lens that compresses um, the tear film on the on the um, cornea, that's a little bit of a different concept than scleral lenses. So in that case, you know, we don't do any overnight wear with scleral lenses or um, reshape the cornea in any way with scleral lenses. Um, okay, next question is corneal scleral lenses still being prescribed? Um, will there be no neovascularization in cornea on long on long on long time use. All right, um, that's a good question. So um, yes, so uh, corneal scleral lenses are, um, I would say they're not being as utilized as frequently as they previously were with the advent of the scleral lenses being larger and more commercially available. A lot of practitioners are using the full scleral lenses so that there's limited um, contact with the limbal um, area there. Now, if there is, um, a lot of vault in that limbal area or if the patient is wearing the lens for too long or sleeping in the lens or anything that um, is non-compliant and, and you know non-compliant um, then we, we may see some neovascularization starting to form however um, with the advent of really good gas permeable lens materials high DK materials we're seeing less and less uh, neovascularization than we were seeing in the past Can scleral lenses um, be fit in cases with scleral thinning? Um, you have to be careful with um, scleral thinning um, because you, you want to make sure that there is no impingement or no frank um, compression in those areas. So I would be very careful. I would probably work closely with a corneal specialist if I'm fitting a patient with um, severe scleral thinning. Uh, you'd like to know the axis stabilization in scleral lenses. So I'm not too sure about that question either. If, if uh, you wouldn't mind um, um, kind of elaborating on what you mean by axis stabilization in scleral lenses, I'd be happy to answer that question as well. 
Um, and then the next question I have here is uh, the solution which is put in into the vault, how long does it stay for dry eye patients? Um, for the most part, um, the solution stays throughout the time of the, the patient wearing the lens. Um, so there's very limited um, tear exchange that does go on. Um, but if a patient, a lot of my patients like to, you know, because the lens always feels much better when they first insert it um, than after, you know, five or six hours of wear. So a lot of them, um, especially my dry eye patients, will like to um, take the lens out, rinse it, um, and then put the lens back in so they have fresh um, saline and fresh solution bathing their cornea. Um, but technically, um, it's good to last, you know, um, up to uh, eight to 10 hours. Who is classified or qualified to fit scleral lenses? Um, so anybody that um, you know has had the training um, and kind of knows enough about scleral lenses to feel comfortable with fitting scleral lenses can do so. I would say you know um, get very familiar with one type of scleral lens, um, get to know it really really well, so that you're able to um, be almost an expert in that scleral lens. And again, you can use um, you know the consultants or um, the manufacturers to help you with. Um, uh, help you with fitting that lens too. Have you checked or any problem with IOP in scleral lenses? Um, are you asking if there's um, a concern for an increase in IOP with scleral lenses? Um, if so, then, then no, there is no concern for increased IOP uh, with scleral lenses. Um, I think in one of the, the pre um, registration questions, someone had asked if there was a way to um, monitor IOP with scleral lenses. And as of now, I don't think so, but I think that that idea is underway. Um, I know for sure it's underway with soft contact lenses and it's been tested multiple times. And, I, and I'm pretty sure it's underway for scleral lenses as well. So if the center, if the lens is centering um, inferiorly, um, that's a great question. There's um, a few things that you want to look for. So if you have too um, high of a central corneal vault, you want to first start to reduce that um, that um, central corneal vault because what's happening is that there's a lot of a fluid reservoir underneath the lens, so it's causing the lens to decenter. The other thing you want to check for is the per peripheral toricity to make sure that the entire um, periphery of the lens is landing evenly. So what can happen is if um, there is a lot of um, toricity in the sclera and the, um, there's a mismatch between the way the sclera lens is aligning with the sclera. There's two edges of the sclera, sclera lens that are landing much harder than the other. So that's not enough pressure to keep that lens in place. So it ends up decentering inferiorly. So you want to make sure that you add some toric peripheral curves to better align the entire um, you know, 360 of the scleral lens. Oh, I have one more. What can be done? Oh, this is an excellent question. So if you find that the removal, small removal plunger is, um, your, your lens is too tight and you're having trouble um, you know, removing the lens, um, what you wanna do is um, use the patient's uh, lid to uh, push up and over and create a bubble underneath the lens. So in this case, you want to create a bubble to um, break the suction between the lens and the conjunctiva. And that has uh, come into come handy uh, a lot for me. So once you get that bubble in there, it breaks the suction and then you can easily remove the lens. All right, thanks everyone for your time.